water circulation. They are swimming and boating hazards. You do not want to swim through these things. Um, and they're spread here by humans, uh, boat trailers, that sort of thing. Um, also by waterfowl. And then once they're in the pond, they get spread by wind uh, and various other things. Milfoil and some of the others are monoculturistic. That means they, they come in, they colonize, and they wipe out all the other species that are there, most of them. And they just take it over for themselves. I'm sure you've seen, seen Phragmites along the highways, along uh, the, uh, the turnpike, and that sort of thing. They work exactly the same way. And um, I'm giving you a run here of what happens with milfoil. They start out that way by basically filling the water column from the surface all the way to the bottom with just milfoil. And then they become emergent. They break through uh, the top of the, the water surface and they begin to flower. And then they start getting really nasty. Um, this is a stage where they actually start changing water temperature, literally filling the entire water column. And then uh, algae moves in. And where, where you have these colonies of uh, milfoil, uh, this is what it looks like. And there are large areas. Fish can't get in there. Uh, it's just a, a very unhealthy situation. The other plant we have is bladderwort. Now, some bladderwort is native. I, I should have said but milfoil that we're dealing with. Um, variable milfoil comes from the southern United States. And the Eurasian milfoil that we have uh, originally came in through um, Siberia. And it was also invited by people. Uh, the first milfoil found in the United States was in the Potomac River and was traced back to the aquarium industry. Because it's a really cool looking plant. You just have a few pieces of it sitting in your aquarium. Some idiot dumped it down the toilet, lousy sewage, and went out in the river, and then the geese got it. And from there on, it's everywhere. Um, bladderwort, and I think there is uh, common bladderwort, is a, is a native and not a problem. But there are two others. One is purple bladderwort, which is also native, but it's kind of gone crazy. And the other is a hybrid called swollen bladderwort, and it has a, a yellow flower. But this is what it looks like. You can see this area this was formerly nice, clear water. And again, this fills everything from the surface all the way to the bottom. It doesn't have a root system, and it grows on the bottom in this gel-like situation. And when the water gets warm, gases, oxygen, fill up these little bladders and it floats to the surface and continues to grow, fill, uh, filling up the whole water column. What's really interesting to me about these things is that they are carnivorous. They eat baby fish, bass fry, not fried bass, bass fry. Um, and so all around they, they're using up oxygen, they're actually eating the babies. And one thing that makes it actually a little worse than milfoil is that it floats. Milfoil stays in place basically grows from around four feet, maximum five feet, down to nothing. Um, whereas bladderwort grows in the same environment, but once it breaks loose, wind just pushes it all over its pond. You're not going to find um, milfoil out in the deep part of the river pond. You're going to find bladderwort, these great big mattresses that are floating around. Not, not a pretty sight. This is what it looks like if you, um, once it's filled with water column, it's just, resides a few inches below the surface. And if you put your hand in, you actually feel the difference, about 10 degree uh, difference in um, temperature, and very dangerous to swim through. If you fell out of a kayak and you were not a strong swimmer, didn't have a life jacket on, it wouldn't be a good thing. We also have floating weed vegetation, and for the most part, in the future, things we have planned, we hope to do, um, occasional partial winter drawdown. That is now possible with a new dam. Um, we don't know whether they're going to be allowed to do it or not. We understand that it takes a lot of permitting. We've looked into some of it. It takes as much permitting as it did to build this dam. And um, we'll be doing some studies. We'll have to do a bathymetric. Am I getting close? No, you're fine. Okay. I'm just, just um, dropping. <laughs> She's giving you more time than she gave me. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're going to look into that, see if we can get the permits to do it. This would not be a whole pond drawdown. I, I don't know how many acres it would affect, probably 10, 15, something like that. It would draw it down about four feet, and it would draw it down in the areas that milfoil and some of these other plants love to uh, thrive. 
And the way it works is at the end of the year, just before the snow, you start very slowly lowering it. Wildlife has a chance to get out of the way, and then it freezes, and the lower parts of the, of the pond freeze over. That's in theory, anyway. So we'll be looking into this.